Welcome and thank you for standing by. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. All participants will be on a listen-only mode for the duration of the call. During the question and answer session, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. I would now like to turn the call over to Anthony Sargas. You may begin. Thank you. Appreciate it. Welcome, everyone, to Connecticut Export Week 2019. Uh, we had our kickoff event, an export form breakfast uh, in Windsor Locks this morning at the Sheridan Hotel at Bradley Airport. I uh, heard everything went re really well, and we're going to kick off today's webinars, uh, this week's webinars, with Speak Their Language, Translation Considerations for Companies Working Internationally. Uh, this webinar, again, is being recorded, and we will be able to share that net replay with you within uh, the next day or so. Uh, this week, um, just again, this week's being sponsored by Santander. We thank you for your sponsorship, Santander. Again, most folks have dialed in now. I know we'll continue to see some folks dial in uh, through the next couple minutes here, um, but we're going to get started in a minute or two. I just want to mention a couple housekeeping items. Again, you can type in questions and answers uh, in the right-hand Q&A box throughout the presentation, but we ask if you, know, you have questions, we're going to have time at the end, probably around 10 minutes or so for Q&A. So we ask if you'd like to hold your questions for verbal at the end, please do that. Um, we still have registration open for the webinars for the remainder of this week, so visit ctexportweek.com. Um, we have at least two webinars a day and a couple in-person events left. Uh, I am going to turn the presentation over to Annie Pagano, Marketing Coordinator with Interpreters and Translators, uh, a local firm here out of Glastonbury, Connecticut, and she's going to be conducting today's presentation. Take it away, Annie. Thank you so much, Tony. Give me one second while I pull up the presentation. All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to join me. I'm really looking forward to speaking with you on translation and interpretation considerations for companies working internationally. As Tony mentioned, my name is Annie Pagano. I am a brand strategist here in our marketing department for ITI. We'll get started with just a quick introduction and background on ITI and myself. Uh, ITI has been in business for 33 years, and we provide multicultural language services to support and enable companies both in working internationally and among multilingual populations here in the United States. Myself, I've worked in the language services industry for eight years full time with ITI, and I've worked across the entire company. So I've worked in the sales department on the client facing side. I've also worked in the translation department and the interpreting department, both scheduling interpreters, uh, managing projects for translation, recruiting translators, recruiting interpreters, and coaching them for their projects. So this has really allowed me to see all the stages of the buyer's journey, and it really gives me a unique perspective on how uh, our industry and our company functions. And so currently, I've been able to bring together all of that knowledge and experience to our marketing team as a brand strategist. And international business, international exporting is definitely one of my favorite topics. We've done a lot of work with the Department of Commerce and District Export Council over the years. So I am really excited to share this presentation with you all. And my goal for the presentation is to enlighten you on the types of language services that are available to you each step of the way when you're working internationally. Whether you're a seasoned exporter or are brand new, I hope to share some inspiration on how language services can support you and also what you can expect for translation requirements. Even if you work with a partner or a distributor with contacts who speak English, it can be tough to really understand their true fluency and ability to effectively convey messages back and forth. So especially when it comes to legal paperwork, important negotiations, and things like labeling requirements that can be quite technical, it's really important uh, that you can trust your translation. So the methodology that we're going to approach the first half of the presentation is from a sales funnel perspective. Um, I'm sure you've all are familiar with some type of sales or marketing funnel. Um, this one that's up on the screen is one that we actually created internally. So we're, we're going to use this framework as we explore what the process looks like when exporting to foreign countries. And along the way, we'll share real-world case studies of how manufacturing, aerospace, and retail companies are actually using these types of language solutions to fuel their international strategy. 
quick look at the agenda. Uh, a majority of the presentation, the first half, will be going through each phase of that sales and marketing funnel. And then I'll offer some tips for effective communication across languages. These are kind of some actionable insight that you can take and apply right away. Um, give you some information on how to best prepare your documents for translation, things to keep in mind when you're working with an interpreter, and how to evaluate a language service company. And we'll also have some time at the end for Q&A, so feel free to add in any questions in the box or you can just ask them at the end, up to you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started in the attract phase. And this stage is all about building awareness and identifying market opportunities. And if the opportunity doesn't come to you organically, then you have to be proactive in search them out. So there are a couple opportunities here. One is a request for proposals, request for quotes, kind of doing your due diligence, seeing if there's any opportunities out there for you to submit an RFP. Um, I'll get an example of this in just shortly here, but um, you don't have to be kind of afraid to submit an RFP in a different country, um, kind of not letting language be the barrier there. And so I'll go into that pretty shortly, but I know a really popular way uh, to kind of break into a new market is to attend a trade show in the target country to identify some type of partner, whether it's a distributor or in a different capacity. And uh, I understand that the natural tendency is to maybe start in an English speaking country like Canada or to find an English speaking partner or maybe uh, starting with a country that you have fluency in, like maybe Spanish and Spanish-speaking countries, which is logical and absolutely a great place to start. Um, but I just want to kind of encourage you not to let that be the, the final line and not let that kind of be where, where you stop because I don't want to kind of let a language barrier stop you from entering a potentially prosperous market. Um, so not really letting language be that barrier and ignoring other potential markets. And while it does make sense to move into a country with a common language or find a partner that shares your native language, I want to caution you from putting all of your trust into that partner to, to translate any of your materials or to kind of be your sole interpreter to translate back and forth between anyone else because that's kind of really giving all of your control away when, you know, they might be pretty comfortable conversing with you in English, but you know, when it comes to maybe technical terminology and when you're getting more into details and technicalities of the contracts or you're talking with different partners, maybe from outside of their organization, it's just that you don't really know how much you can trust their linguistic abilities. And so I just want to talk quickly about the benefits of working with a professional language service company or an LSC. And I mean, I think the biggest thing here is really just the, tr the trust and reliability, the, the trust that you have that you know that this is a, a trained, experienced professional, this is, this is their specialty, is facilitating communication back and forth. So again, whether that's an interpreter uh, facilitating a, a spoken conversation, whether it's in person or over the phone, or a translator who's performing a written translation, I'll just take a second to kind of differentiate um, because they're used very interchangeably, but an interpreter is facilitating the spoken word. So it's a lot more, it really is facilitating communication while the translator is translating the written word. And that's a lot more of a little bit of an art and a science, but you can kind of understand why in translation it has to be very exact. There, there can't be any mistakes when you're translating something that is going to be printed out and handed to people at trade shows or a contract or a piece of your handbook or your website. It's a very, very exact and accuracy is really important. And so when you're working with professionals, especially with a language service company who gets to know you and uh, your, your company and the environment that you're working in, uh, there's just a lot more consistency so you know that you, you have a back-end partner and that you can trust them and rely on them. And uh, quite frankly, just translation is really just an essential piece of any global strategy and when it's done correctly, it can really 
give you a competitive edge against any other companies from outside of the country because you're really portraying yourself in the same light that, that you're intending to. Let's give an example of in this phase of Sikorsky, which uh, is one of our clients that we've worked with for a long time. And I think this is a great example that showcases that you can submit RFPs, requests for proposals in different countries and languages. Uh, basically, a couple of years back, uh, Sikorsky was submitting an RFP in a South American country to sell product to their government. So the, the whole RFP, all of their responses and answers had to be translated into Spanish for that specific country. And this was about a year-long process, which required extremely close communication between our two teams with many tight turnarounds and quick deadlines. As you can imagine, if any of you have experience with submitting, going through the RFP, RFQ process, just in English, it can be very tedious. And, you know, once you get into it, maybe there's a Q&A section or there's a little bit of back and forth for clarifications, um, things like that. Then as you get deeper into the process, there can be, depending on the depth of it, there can be a lot of kind of quick turnarounds that they're expecting. So when you think about having to translate all of that into a different language, not only is the deadline important, but it's also important that it's translated correctly because you're putting so much time into the, the English text and your responses. You don't want to kind of have that be, be ruined by having kind of a, a shoddy translation. And maybe you have a, a team member who speaks Spanish, uh, but you know, their job isn't to translate. They have a lot of other things on their plate. So if you're just kind of throwing uh, either the RFP or if it's really anything for translation onto their plate and they haven't, they don't really have experience, they just maybe grew up speaking conversational Spanish in their family, then it might not be translated in the best manner possible. And Sikorsky, um, you know, just a lot of wrapping back around extreme detail had to be taken to ensure that the proposal was accurately conveyed and they did end up winning that contract. Another opportunity in the attract phase is kind of the is pretty straightforward, but you know when you're going out uh, to to these trade shows, getting some boots on the ground and everything like that, translating your sales and marketing collateral, business cards, if you have any maybe how to or product videos that are on your website, things of that nature, you can subtitle them, add a voiceover, and just things things like this when you're going into a new market. It just really is a, a show of good faith, which can go a long way in establishing a foundation to build a strong relationship on. And another quick example of one of our clients who is currently doing this is Oxford Performance Materials, which is a biomedical manufacturing firm. And in the past couple of years, they've opened offices in Japan and China. So we've translated a lot of pamphlet, pamphlets, forms, and business cards for their employees so they can present themselves appropriately overseas. And just wanted to use this as an example because it's not just, you know, the Sikorsky's and the UTC's of the world, the real big guys, a lot of, you know, small, medium-sized manufacturing companies are, are doing these things uh, to present themselves appropriately. Moving on to goodwill, this stage is where you want to provide value to potential customers and partners. And while goodwill and trust, which we'll go to in next, are, are very closely related and tend to overlap, for the sake of our discussion today, we're going to focus this segment on how your business and overall brand is portrayed to the world. So you want to consider your brand positioning and messaging in this phase. How do you want to be portrayed by the new market? And by taking your translation into your control and working with a reliable language service company that's at your back end partner, you control your brand and messaging. So the main thing I want to focus on in this phase is your, your website, because even if you, you know, go to the trade shows, you're making in-person connections, maybe there's some referrals. Um, that you're meeting people at the end of the day, once you kind of step away and you exchange information, they're going to go to your website. Your website really is the, the gateway. It's the, the face of your company. So if you're targeting, you know, say it's 
a Spanish-speaking country or an Asian-speaking country that you want to work in and sell your products or services, it's really important that you have your website translated and local, localized. And you don't have to translate your full website. You can create a microsite. And what that is is just taking the key pages that are applicable to that market and translating them. So, you know, maybe it's just your home page, about us, contact us, uh, maybe your services or your products. Maybe you have, you know, maybe you sell hundreds of different component parts, but only a small fraction of those would be applicable to this new market. So you don't have to translate every service or product page. Just pick the most important ones that are going to give you the biggest return on investment in this market and just translate that. So you can be really strategic about it. And I just want to touch on briefly uh, search engine optimization or SEO and keyword localization. Uh, just in the, in the manner that translation and localization is so important to your SEO strategy and just overall optimization of your website. Um, it may be kind of tempting to just throw a Google Translate plugin or maybe just throw all of your content through a machine translation, but it just isn't gonna, I mean, as we all know, if you've ever gone onto a website that isn't originally in English and you had it switch over to English, it just mixes up words. It just doesn't do quite a good job of translating it when there's not a human touch on it. Especially with the, uh, the Asian languages, it really can't differentiate when how certain characters relate to each other. Um, so I have a kind of example of a translation fail there where it's almost on point, but it just doesn't quite make sense. And the, the biggest thing as far as your website goes, if you just have it machine translated is if there's a poor translation, the search engines are going to view that as poor content, which is going to lead to poor rankings. So, aka you're less likely to be found. So, not only does that not really look good to the visitor and it disrupts the user experience, but also the search engines aren't going to really know what to do with it. So, any opportunities to be found organically or kind of just not going to be there. People aren't really going to be able to find your website. I'd like to use, just dive into one small piece of website localization because there are so many different factors that can go into localizing a website beyond just translating the actual text on there. So I'll use Nike as an example. Uh, I've kind of regularly checked up on Nike's website over the past couple years whenever I'm either working on a localization project or working on localization content. I think it, it kind of helps to look at, you know, really big multinational companies that everybody's familiar with and, and see how they're localizing their content across the board. And it's changed slightly, but not by too much. So that makes me, leads me to believe that they're not kind of like right in the middle of, of updating all of this. So I want to take a look at their global gateway as an example here, and that's this page here. It's where you're prompted to either select your location or your language that you want to view the website in. And you do see this in a lot of, again, like Nike, Apple, Nestle, really big companies that are extremely global. And so you can see that Nike chose to, to section this off by, by country and by location. But once you actually go in there and you start clicking into a lot of these different countries, you'll notice that most of them, the websites that you bring it to, it brings you to, are still in English. It's, it's, very, it's very strange, and they did translate a lot of the, the country names into the language that is spoken there, but not all of them. So they did half of them are translated into the native language, half aren't. Um, the use of flags is okay here because it is associated with a country, um, but it's just really uh, just like to caution you to just kind of stay away from flags because it brings in a lot of like political issues and definitely never use a flag with a language because, because flags and languages aren't, countries and languages aren't synonymous. I mean, a lot of languages are spoken across a lot of different countries. So the, the best thing here is to just really Keep it simple. I mean, this disrupts the user experience. There's, there's no reason to have it be so complex when a majority of these locations are still in English anyway. And then just to wrap up this, also when you go to the Middle East and Africa, they have you know a couple of country names and then just the rest of the Middle East and the rest of Africa. And there could definitely be a strategic, logical reason for this. I mean, 
maybe in those other countries in the Middle East and Africa, there might be uh, legalities there. Maybe they don't sell there. Maybe they can't sell there. You, you never really know, but it just kind of brings you back to why even list out the countries if you're going to kind of just stop there. I mean, if you were a, a user that wanted to look at Nike in any of those other countries, I mean, I'd probably not feel as valued if every other country in the world has their country listed out and then it just kind of stops. So it's just, you know, it's, it would be a lot more much, it would be much more streamlined and offer an improved user experience to just offer a list of languages the website is available in. So the main point I want to get across here is with le website localization, less is definitely more. Keep things simple. Uh, I could go on with tons of examples of elements to take into consideration for websites. I've done past presentations and webinars with the Department of Commerce just on website localization alone. I have a ton of content up on our website. So if you'd like to see the past presentation or want more details on this topic, um, definitely shoot me an email, Annie Pagano at ititranslates.com. I'd be happy to share any, uh, any content on that and give you some more details. Annie, and also, are you finished with website? I just have one question for you for website globalization. <clears throat> Uh, I have one more example, but I am wrapping up, so yeah, go ahead. Can you just mention, I know in previous presentations you've done with us, the 5% rule that you typically mentioned. I think it's just kind of an interesting rule of thumb when you're considering oh, yeah. translation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the 5% rule, one thing when we're talking about website localization is when, you know, so you might be, you might have a country that you, you know you want to target, there's a good opportunity, but if you're maybe trying to identify a country to enter, you're still doing your research, one thing we recommend is to take a look at your Google Analytics, look at your website analytics, and it's, it's pretty simple. I'm sure someone on your marketing team, someone knows how to set that up and access it, maybe yourself. It, it'll show you where the country of origin, where your visitors are coming from. So one thing that we suggest is this kind of 5% rule. If you notice that there's a country that is making up 5% or more of your website traffic, then that's something you want to take a serious look at because if it's already just in, you know, English and you have a lot of visitors from Chile or Argentina visiting, then you might want to seriously take a look at that market, maybe consider creating a little micro site in Spanish for that country, see if you can get some more traffic. And that's kind of how you can find some organic leads and maybe identify a market that you hadn't considered before. So thank you, Tony, for mentioning that. Yeah. And then also I just want to quickly mention um, a grant that we just found out about the Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development offers a grant where you can get reimbursed for website translation. It's called the STEP grant. So there are great resources out there. If you have more questions, you can definitely reach out to Tony. But um, I think that's a really awesome resource that all of you can take advantage of and get reimbursed for website translation, maybe even some marketing materials to go to those trade shows and things like that. And then quickly, I just want to run through an example of someone who's doing a, a good job with their website localization, which is Apple. And it's a really good example of kind of keeping things simple. So you can see on the left there is Apple's English website, and then on the right is Chinese. Uh, they're using a global template, so you can see they, nothing is changing. A couple more examples. Nothing's changing except for the translation of the text. So, you know, the focus is all on the product. It's, it's simple, neutral color is an easy template, and it's just very simple, and that's, that's a great way to do it. Keeps the, the focus on the actual text. So now we'll move on to trust, which is the relationship building phase of the funnel. So you've made contact with a prospect and are conversing back and forth about how you can work together. First thing when you're starting to build a relationship is considering the culture that you're going to be working with. So, you know, really taking some steps to learn about the business culture that you'll be, that you'll be working within. Uh, every culture, every country has kind of different business norms. So while it may be typical here in the United States to kind of go straight, straight to business and business talk, a lot of other countries may require social activity or at least 
kind of discussing, getting to know each other on a personal level before discussing details of a, de of a deal. And this is something that we kind of just offer inherently with our clients. Uh, we have dedicated account managers. You really get to know a small team within our company. And so if you have any questions, it's kind of all part of the just consulting and starting to work together. And we're also pretty flexible if you'd like to create something more formal and a training for any of your team, then that's something that we can also offer as well. Also, uh, take a, uh, using interpreters for different meetings. So there's two modes of interpretation. There's consecutive, which is where the interpreter is facilitating communication between two parties where one party, you know, I would speak for, you know, maybe 30, 45 seconds and then pause and then the interpreter interprets and then the other party says what they have to say, pause. So their interpreter is kind of facilitating between the two while a simultaneous interpreter is interpreting at the same rate as someone is speaking. And so this is really popular. You see this in a lot of conferences. This is also uh, used a lot in just maybe business presentations, uh, webinars like we're doing right now, web meetings. It can be used on a conference call. If it's anything that's remote, we would set up different channels for the interpreter. If it's in person, certain people who need the interpretation, then they would have a headset. So there's some technology that's involved there, but um, that's a really great option. And, and the main thing with interpreters as far as, you know, business meetings, um, conversations, negotiations, is you, it's just a neutral third party to facilitate the conversation. So they're, they'll learn about what you're talking about. They can accurately convey it, but it's just completely unbiased, uh, which I think is a really big value add. And it's also kind of important to remember as you're, you know, moving through the stages of building this relationship that even if someone speaks English and, you know, you may have one contact who's really very fluent in English, but then they bring in maybe some of their business associates or partners who may not have that level of fluency. And even if they're pretty comfortable in conversational English, uh, they may be more comfortable conversing in their native language or their, their level of English may not be as advanced to talk about the more technical, high-level subjects. So that's really something to keep in mind that there's, there's different levels of fluency. And then lastly, just want to touch on product localization. So, you know, if you have an actual product, uh, you know, considering if it needs to be adjusted for the market that you're going to enter into just kind of all things to keep in mind. And another thing with the, the product itself is considering maybe how the name translates, uh, which is something that's very easy to overlook, especially if you're kind of, uh, you know, making up the name, so to say. And I just wanted to share an example of this with Audi. Their electric car is called the e-tron, which unfortunately for Audi sounds very shockingly similar to the French word atron, which is, translates to turd crap or fecal matter. And the backlash on social media was immediate. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty funny, and this may not completely relate to you. Obviously, Audi and other car manufacturers are very much in the public eye. Everybody knows the different car manufacturers, but I think it's just still a great example of of things that you may, that are easy to overlook and you may, may not even consider. So whether it's, you know, the name of the product or, or different things on your website, it's just, it's just something interesting to think about when you're, you're converting your, your brand, your messaging, your product names, taglines to another language for another culture. Um, something to, to just keep in mind. And, yeah, this is, this is pretty funny, and maybe it doesn't, you know, completely deter French speakers from purchasing the vehicle, um, but I'm sure that the Audi executives didn't really think this was that funny, especially when people are now making jokes at their expense how their cars are piles of crap. Um, and it, it can just be interpreted differently. We've seen this with, with car manufacturers in the past. So... Snafus like this can definitely, it can, you never know the impact it's going to have on people's perspective on your brand. So what's the best way to gain trust from prospects and potential clients? To develop a strong, reliable, and trustworthy internal team. 
few examples of this is maybe educating your U.S.-based team on the new market that you're entering, the new relationship that you're developing, or, or new client. Uh, if you begin to build a team in the other country, even if it's just independent contractors or vendors, do you have any internal trainings or internal materials that would benefit them to learn about your company? Would it benefit them to translate it so that they can, the more knowledgeable they are on your firm, the better that they can, you know, if they're a reseller or a distributor, the better that they can do your job because they really have a firm grasp of, of the product that you're selling and really what your, your selling points are. And I'll share a couple of kind of internal training case studies here. The first one uh, comes from actually one of my colleagues in one of her previous jobs. She was a corporate trainer for a company who did medical claims. And the medical claim company was based here in the United States and they outsourced all of their indexing claims to India. So her task was to her task, she was tasked with training on how to index the claims that were forwarded to them. The company had a training manual on how to index certain things. The Indian partner spoke English. The training manual and training was in English. Everything was very well understood. There was, there was no confusion. Everyone was on the same page with English. But there was a cultural difference in how information being presented was, inter was being interpreted, even though it was all the same language. Basically, they needed to achieve a 97% accuracy in indexing claims. The American partner approved the claims. There were, so, there were a lot of different exceptions that weren't included in the training manual, so there weren't any rules for them. So the Indian partners were handling these exceptions in a different way, which severely impacted their accuracy rate. And some examples of this were the way that names were entered. For example, on the indexing on the computer system, it would add, you, there'd be a field for first name, last name, or for date, uh, you know, day, month, year. But if the doctor or, you know, medical practitioner on the sheet wrote, you know, if it was for me, they wrote Pagano, comma, Annie, instead of Annie Pagano, the Indian partners would see Pagano first and put Pagano as the first name and Annie as the last name. And the same thing with dates. Most other countries organize their dates by month, day, year, which is different from us. And so they were just kind of plugging and playing, but if it was written in a different way, they didn't fully under, understand what was what because they have different name structures, things of that nature. So basically, once they identified that this was the issue, both teams created a system on how to verify how exceptions were handled on both sides, and their accuracy rate shot up to 99.5% after that. So just a great example how even when you're working in the same language, there can still be misunderstanding. And then second example is a strategic planning example from one of our business partners and consultants who does executive level strategic planning. And he shared this story with myself with a uh, company, a big multinational company that he was working with to implement a new global strategy. And there, he went to 11 different executive uh, teams throughout the world, and there were four executive divisions in particular that um, kind of had some problems. He, he asked the teams beforehand if they would, you know, like an interpreter to be there to facilitate the conversation in the meeting, and everybody denied it because they were, they were very comfortable in English. They spoke English fluently, but once he was there and getting these training sessions and workshops going, he just noticed there wasn't very much participa participation, um, not much engagement, just kind of felt like he was hitting a wall a little bit. And so he did end up bringing in professional interpreters, and he said immediately he just saw, and he had kind of, you know, a certain way to bring it in so as to not, you know, just be a little bit confident of people's feelings and everything, but brought in the interpreter and and everything, engagement just shot up, participation shot up, and it was just really much more, much more uh, successful. And the, the main thing being there is although they were comfortable communicating in English, these were very high level sessions that required critical thinking in English. So just because you're comfortable communicating in English for these, you know, high level sessions with critical thinking and negotiation and 
I'm not sure what industry this company was in. Maybe it was pretty technical that it was just they were a lot more comfortable communicating and discussing things in their native language. Okay, moving on to convert. So you're ready to sign a client or new partner. This is where there is a lot of legalities as far as translation is concerned in this phase. So there may be contracts that need to be signed, legal paperwork, once you're preparing any of your products for export, your export documentation, labels, all types of things go into this, this section. And really, this is where, I mean, it's all accuracy is always important, but especially with legalities, um, you know, mistakes in this phase can damage a deal, they can, or they can delay a deal, it can lead to litigation or financial loss. So you really want to be 100% sure that you work with professionals that you can trust. And another thing about working with a professional language service company, instead of, you know, just kind of giving Bill and HR, who also speaks <laughs> Spanish, any of this translation is that, you know, we would probably, we'll identify the best suited linguist for the job. So, you know, translating your website and marketing materials may be a different linguist than translating these contracts and legal paperwork. Um, you know, the marketing materials, sales sheets, we might want someone who has that explicit experience in the technical industry, the industry that you work in, but on the contracts, legal paperwork, export documentation, we might want someone that has more of that legal experience that only does contracts, paperwork, does a lot of export documentation, things of that nature. So they, even within the specialty of translation, there's specialty translators for each different project that you may have. So I'll just share a couple companies that we do this for all the time is Sikorsky and Colt. Sikorsky, we're uh, constantly translating legal contracts for Middle Eastern and Asian countries, which enables them to pursue business deals and conduct proper negotiations in those countries. And Colt, we also translate all of their business contracts. And then once those deals close, we translate their operators' manuals, conversion kits, maintenance manuals, which leads us really nicely into the final phase, which is delight. This is all about um, client retention, post-sale, customer support and service. So really keeping our clients happy, setting them up for success. And so this is where there's a lot of the technical translation, um, you know, handbooks, manuals, installation checklists, all the way down, down the list. I'm not gonna read everything line by line. I'm sure all of you are maybe familiar with these types of products. Um, and so I just really can't stress the importance of accuracy here enough. I mean, you know, think about, can you really afford to have mistakes in these types of documents? Um, you know, if there's a mistake in the installation checklist or your machine diagrams or your training materials, I mean, what, what would the repercussions be if there are mistakes there? Also a really great service to consider uh, once you kind of have an established relationship with a client partner, even if it's a distributor in a different country, is an over-the-phone interpreting account um, is really great for customer service. I mean, you never know. Maybe you do have, you know, a bunch of bilingual Spanish-speaking staff. Uh, maybe who you are working with was the owner or management that speaks English, but, you know, what if your bilingual staff is out sick or on vacation or you know, your client in the other country, if, if the person that's actually doing the installation or working on the product might be someone much different than who you're working with to set everything up and maybe they're not fluent in English and they have questions or things of that nature, um, an over-the-phone interpreting account is just a great fail-safe solution to have in your back pocket in case you need it. Um, interpreters are available in over 200 languages, less than 30 seconds, 24-7, 365, you just, you're assigned to your own account, you can access the interpreter very quickly, and they can also be available on a scheduled basis for scheduled calls or conference calls, um, which just requires a setup of multilingual conference calling line, which is very quick and easy. So again, just kind of something to keep in your toolkit in case you need it. And two companies that we work with also with kind of keeping customers happy are Sperry Rail and United Technologies. 
Barry Rail, we translate all of their handbooks for new clients when they have a new client in a different country. And these are really technical handbooks for their rail flaw detection product. And we've been working with Sperry for many, many years. So um, it's the type of thing where we know their company, we know their products, we, we know how things need to be translated. And it's just a really quick, seamless process for them. They just kind of send us what they need done, give them a quote and, and you know, deliver as quick as we can. United Technologies is uh, we have really interesting. We've done a lot of kind of innovative and cool projects with them. They're really fun to work with because we kind of get to flex our creative muscles and really figure out how to deliver the best solution for what they're looking for. And I love this example. What we did for them recently is they were hosting a global training for technicians representing five different countries and languages. Uh, so we basically displayed a localized version of the PowerPoint presentation for each person that required a different language. And we also had a simultaneous interpreter on the line to interpret the presentation in real time for those that didn't speak English. So nothing was lost in this presentation, but everything was gained and that the participants were able to interact with the presenter come question time. And they were more informed because the information being presented was in their native language. So that just leads to a much higher level of retention of the information, which in turn will lead to a lower, lower cost, lower risk of mistakes when they're out in the field. So now we'll move on to the second half of the presentation. Definitely want you guys to be able to leave here with some actionable insight if you'd like to kind of take this to the next level. So we'll give you a couple of tips for um, effectively communicating across languages and when you're actually working with these services. So we'll start with preparing your documents for translation. First things first, seems obvious, but I feel like I always have to say it, is to finalize your content, proofread it, make sure you're happy with the English, make sure maybe it's up to date if you have old handbooks or manuals or checklists, you know, before you are sending it for translation, make sure everything's up to date and, and how it should be. Next, I'll kind of put these two together, but it's providing the source files. So especially for your, your manuals, if you have blueprints, things that include maybe graphs, images, different things of that nature, um, if you can provide the original, original, original editable files, it will avoid any additional time and costs. Because if you have a PDF that can't be manipulated, then that just needs to be completely recreated, which we can definitely do. But again, it'll just save you some time and money if you have those original files. And on that note as well, with when you're dealing with maybe design files for the manuals, blueprints, things like that, um, understand that there may need to be text manipulation. Most languages either expand or contract by up to 20% from English. So this, this may or may not severely in alter the format of any given document. Uh, you know, maybe you have a one page sales sheet or spec sheet that you like to bring to trade shows. And if there's barely any white space in, in English and you know, you have all these graphics and images, then if you're translating it to Spanish, it may need to be double sided or we can work with you to adapt the content to keep it to one page. But you know, I, it's just something I like to mention. There's always different solutions, but just important to, to know that when you're translating, it may not look exactly the same. And you know, if you have the original files, that would be best. Subject matter information, the more that you can prepare the team working on your translation with background information on the, the document, the project, and of your company as well. Um, a brief synopsis of what they're translating is just always very helpful for the translator. The more detail and direction you can give us, the more that the translator will be able to perform a high quality translation. There's, you know, a, there's a lot of different ways that you can say one sentence in just English alone. So when you're, you're conveying that in a different language, there's, there's different opportunities for a different word choice. So the more that we understand the environment that you're living and working in the, and how your company wants to present itself, then the better that we can accurately uh, convey that in the language, the target language. And then lastly, I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but I just want to mention it's definitely something to talk to your language service partner on is consulting on glossary creation, style guides, term bases, and translation memory. 
And basically, these are all just tools that professionals such as ourselves use to ensure consistency, accuracy, and even faster turnaround times over time, the more that we work together. So basically these, you know, a glossary, it just is a way for us to store your industry and company terminology, your preferred translation, just general lingo and different things that you want to be consistent across all documents and across all languages. And we'll move into working with an interpreter. And I just want to preface this section by saying that this is when you're working with a consecutive interpreter. So when there's that kind of pause and they're speaking between you and another party. Simultaneous interpreter, once there's a lot of more preparation there with the equipment and technical side of things, but then you don't have to really worry about these things. So if you find yourself working with an interpreter between you and a few people, first thing I like to mention is to, uh, is the time, you know, be ready to, be ready for the meeting to last about twice the amount of time because everything is being said twice between the two of you. Same thing as with the translation, whether it's this is simultaneous or consecutive, um, you know, the more background you can give to the interpreter or, you know, to the team that you're working with at your language service partner of what the meeting or presentation is going to be about, any important details, specific terminology um, that will just better prepare the interpreter on, on what to expect and they can in turn prepare themselves, maybe looking up certain translations and things like that. Know that everything said will be interpreted and also everything will be kept confidential. Speak in the first person it may feel a little unnatural at first, but the interpreter is there kind of to really work in the background and facilitate communication. So speak not to the interpreter, speak to who you're speaking to in first person and, you know, maintain eye contact with them. The interpreter won't be offended. They're just there to kind of be that, that neutral third party to, to make sure that you guys are able to communicate. Be clear and make pauses. So just knowing that someone is there interpreting. So maybe it, avoid talking for minutes at a time. That way they can do the best job of really conveying and interpreting what you're, what you're saying. So 30, 45 seconds up to a minute. I'm just pausing to let them, give them time to interpret. And on that note, it is, uh, it is common practice for an interpreter to take notes. Uh, these days they may be using their phone. So it's just something that I think is really useful to, to know that if the interpreter is taking notes or if they're taking notes on their phone, that's, that's common practice. They have different kind of tools and tricks for memory retention. They want to make sure they're getting all the, the key words and topics that you're saying. So um, they may have a dictionary. They may look things up. That doesn't mean that they're not a good interpreter. It just means that they're, they're using these tools to make sure that they're doing the best possible to, to facilitate your conversation. Site translation, if you're, you know, in a meeting or a conversation or, or an interview, perhaps, uh, there may be some documents that are being passed back and forth, and interpreters can site translate short informative documents, but no longer than a couple paragraphs, and they cannot site translate legal forms or any kind of form that has legal ramifications. That really needs to be sent to your language service company that you're partnered with. That should be done by a professional translation. Um, that's just kind of against their code of ethics and really site translation is just to help, you know, maybe there's a cover page in a paragraph where you're like, oh, what does this say? That's fine. But if a contract needs to be signed, then in there, they, they can't translate that contract on the spot. That needs to be done a professional certified translation. And then lastly, just touching on um, the interpreters know this, just not leaving the interpreter alone. If they're there with you, they should stay there with you. Um, just part of their code of ethics uh, for liability reasons that, you know, if you step out of the room, they need to step out of the room. And again, just, just knowing the environment that you're working with and why maybe interpreters are doing what they're doing. I think it's important for people to understand when working with these services. And lastly, evaluating a language service company. So you know that you need these services. How do you kind of identify the right, the best suited partner to work with you? We suggest putting together a scope of work. So just kind of like you'd identify any other service provider, any other product. You want to do your 
due diligence. And this is really something that ideally, if you're, you know, exporting, starting this relationship in another country, it's someone you want to work with on a consistent basis. I mean, they're your partner in communication and in language. So you really, they're going to be working together long term. So, you know, put together scope of work on the types of language, the services you need, the languages and countries you anticipate requiring translation for, any kind of budget and time frame you may have, uh, any kind of volume estimate can kind of help as leverage when you're negotiating rates. And then once you have that together, you'll be able to assess the LSC's capabilities in regards to your scope. Lastly, I just wanted to leave you guys with some suggestions for questions to kind of get the conversation going. Um, some of these may be obvious, but just some uh, suggestions to really evaluate whether or not they're a good fit. Um, you know, talking about how long they've been in business, what's their reputation, how do they recruit linguists, are their linguists trained, do they require uh, ongoing training, what's their experience in your specific industry, can you contact any of their references, What's their confidentiality policy? How do they handle quality assurance? Should anything go wrong? Um, how responsive are they? Uh, not only in terms of, you know, trying to sign you on as a, as a partner, but in terms of your request, providing quotes, scheduling an interpreter. There's, you know, like I said, there can be tight turnaround times. So are they, are they reliable? Are they responsive? And then also, you know, who will you be working with, with within that team? Are you going to, just have a general customer service line? Are you going to have a dedicated team? And again, you can decide on your own how important each of these factors are to you, but something to consider because like in any other industry, a lot of language service companies have different structures, work in different ways, and you know, it's just something that you really want to assess because you'll most likely hopefully be working with them for the long term. So just some final thoughts on, um, you know, we really are here to more to support and enable you in your international endeavors. Uh, when, when you succeed, we succeed. We want to see you succeed in these other markets. We want to just be your partner in communication, working in the background to break down all linguistic and cultural barriers. So I hope that I really just got across that you don't have to let a language uh, deter you from entering a new market. And yeah, that's pretty much all I have. So we do have some time left for Q and A. Thank you, Annie. Thank you for and, the presentation. Really good. Information. Yeah. So awesome. I'm going to ask the operator to open up the line for questions at this time, and I think we have one, one or two written questions in our Q and A box. Are there? Okay. Operator, can you open the, the lines for questions? I sure will. At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 from your phone, unmute your line, and record your first and your last name clearly when prompted. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press star 2. Once more, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 from your phone and unmute your line. One moment as you wait for our first question. So, Annie, I'll, we'll wait for the question to come in. I'll ask you the first one. I don't know if you saw it. So, do you suggest... I, yeah, I see it right now. Do you see the back translation strategy question? Yeah. Yep, so do you suggest a back translation strategy when working with a firm to translate marketing materials? You know, back translation, that is one thing I forgot to mention. I don't, that's kind of tough. I don't necessarily suggest it for all marketing materials. Back translation is definitely, so for anyone who doesn't know, back translation is, so say you have a one Say you have one paragraph, your About Us page. We'll just use that as an example. In English, we would translate it into Spanish, and then we would send that translation to a different translator, and they would translate it back into English. So this is uh, a way that you can kind of on your own check the translation, because you have two different translators translating it. It's not always, it's not going to back translate the exact way, but you can at least tell from the 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 meaning and inference of everything. So we don't really do too much back translation just because it's not really uh, requested all that much. I want to read the end of this. I'd more suggest versus back translation because you're going to be paying for two translations. If if that would make you feel comfortable, maybe to start with certain documents, but. 
I don't think it's necessarily, I don't think it's really necessary to do that for your marketing materials. I think the better way to do it is to really have that conversation and more identifying the key words and phrases. So when I kind of mentioned the glossaries and term bases, I think what would be more effective for you and a better use of your resources um, financially and otherwise would be to create that glossary or term base. So if it's your marketing materials, work with your partner on how to translate, whether it's your tagline, those keywords and phrases, whether it's the product, a certain description, I'd work more on, on that. And we, you know, whether it's us or someone else, they can provide you basically three or four options on how that would be translated. So say it's, um, you know, say it's the phrase, speak their language, which is kind of a little bit creative language. It wouldn't necessarily directly translate. So say that's like a key phrase that you use to describe one of your products. So you say, we want to know how to translate this. We can say, okay, into Spanish, here's three different ways to translate speak their language, and here's roughly how those three different options translate back into English. So that's kind of more what I would suggest is working with your partner to, to create that glossary or term base and really building up your database for those keywords and phrases versus doing a complete back translation where it gets a little bit, it can get a little convoluted and what may not look right to you could still be right. So I'd more take it, take it in that, that direction because then that will also ensure the consistency over time because they're storing all of those preferences for you. Thank you, Annie. Operator, do we have any mm -hmm. questions? There are no questions over the phone. Well, we have a couple minutes, so I just wanted to mention, no, thank you, Annie, so much for doing this presentation, you know, definitely enlightening, a lot of really good information. Um, I will be following up with an email, and I will specifically um, send information on the STEP grant as well through the Connecticut DECD. And I know there are some folks out of state as well, so if they look at their state um, organization that handles, you know, economic development, um, I think most states have the STEP grant. I want to speak for every state or you could look at the SBA step grant program on the SBA site uh, if you're out of state and you can identify that information or send me an email and I can get you that as well. So we'll send that. Uh, Annie's going to send a copy of the presentation. She's going to compress it down a little bit because it's a large file and get that out to everyone. And then uh, I will also be sharing a replay of this um, webinar probably tomorrow morning sometime once it's cleared. Annie, do you have oh, other final I'll... thoughts or anything else you want to mention? <laughs> Yeah, just the last thing that I forgot to mention, but um, yeah, as Tony mentioned, I will send, I'll, I'll compress the presentation and send it out to you, um, some more information on us. Also, if you'd like the la the second half of the presentation with the preparing documents for translation and working with an interpreter, I have those, that section as a PDF that has a little bit more details, some more of what I spoke about versus just the bullet points. So if you would, if you would like that, just, you know, just respond. It'll come directly from my email. Um, like I said, I have a ton of stuff up on our blog, past presentations. So if you want any more information on anything we touched on, definitely um, just, you know, reach out, start a conversation. And we'd be happy to discuss it with you. Yeah, just again, we still have registration open for CT Export Week. You know, a lot of great webinars this week. Um, we have an Export Compliance and Documentation Roundtable that's in person in Middletown tomorrow. And then we have an in-person event, uh, Global Intellectual Property Considerations in Hartford on Thursday. And the rest of the week, it's a bunch of webinars. Um, just wanted to thank Annie again. I will ask the operator one more time if there's any last questions. Any questions, operator? There are no questions in the queue. All right, thank you everyone again for joining us for the first uh, webinar for Export Week. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you for your participation in today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.